So that's pretty legit that you're at. Did you go to MIT once you were in, or was that where you went for like your undergrad and stuff like that? No, I um, I went to undergrad at University of Colorado in Boulder. Okay. Yeah, I came to MIT uh, to do my war college school. Mm. It's a the school that they send lieutenant colonels to, um, or colonels to. And they have a few opportunities where you can do fellowships at universities. So they, they sent me to MIT to do a fellowship. And then while I was here, this position was created, like this or, whole organization was created. And so I, I had a very fortuitous timing to be available and local um, and, uh, you know, fascinated in the, the area of artificial intelligence. Uh, so. I raised my hand and uh, went through an interview process, but they uh, they selected me to to be the director of this org. That's awesome, man. That's uh, what a what a what an awesome opportunity, you know, to go to one of the top schools in the world, you know, get paid to go there and, and work. Yeah. And now you get now you get a job there. And AI is really such an interesting topic and such an evolving thing that is having a larger and larger effect on people's lives. And I think a lot of people don't realize how much. AI is like being involved in, I'm, I'm, so I'm in advertising. I just graduated from San Diego State University with an advertising nice. degree. And um, there's a lot of AI and stuff in, in advertising. There's a copywriting going to AI and stuff. So it's a, it's a oh, really yeah. interesting field. And MIT is cool. I was telling somebody on the podcast previously, um, I like to, because I'm a nerd, I like to uh, pull up MIT open courseware and mm -hmm. read about some, you know, or uh, watch those videos on YouTube. I'm in the middle of the, uh, I was doing the Python lectures and now Ooh. I'm, uh, I'm looking over the Bitcoin. They have one for a cryptocurrency and stuff like that. And it's a really good, it's the whole, I mean, you know how it is. It's a whole series. So yeah. really interesting stuff. But anyways, I just wanted to bring that up. Um, so Tucker Hamilton, thanks for uh, joining me on the podcast, man, for former XS podcast. Um, let's start off from the beginning of your career. So what you're in the air force, what made you decide to go with the air force? Yeah, well, it's funny. I never really planned on serving ever. It was never this um, this huge desire of mine. I, I will say, growing up, um, it was instilled in me uh, the importance of serving your community. My my parents were both volunteer firefighters. My mom was a paramedic, uh, so I knew that that was really important. I also knew that I wanted to become an astronaut. That was like my goal from you know I was like twelve years old, mm -hmm. um, and so I. Uh, went to the University of Colorado, uh, planned on studying aerospace engineering. And right before school started in my freshman year, I got a, like a flyer in the mail that said Air Force ROTC. And I didn't know anything about it. I gave them a call. And, and this is also the time where like Saving Private Ryan had just come out. Mm. <laughs> I was like, yeah. you know, people are dying for my freedoms and the whole line of like earning it at the end of that movie. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Right. Um, you know, it, it made me um, want to look into it. I was curious about it. So I called them up and they said, hey, there's no commitment. You just come check out a class. It's a good opportunity to learn, uh, to meet, you know, new people while you're at, at university. And um, I went and I, I fell in love with it almost right away. I, I loved the atmosphere. I loved the, um, the people were just good virtuous, uh, you know, individuals that were there trying to, you know, serve something greater than themselves. And so I, I really um, kind of signed up on a whim and it just so happened that Air Force ROTC was the one that, uh, <laughs> that caught me yeah. with a flyer. Um, and uh, I, I did know that also, you know, being an astronaut, going that path was not a bad path, you know, to keep that door open, to be able to serve in some capacity. And I was an aerospace engineer, uh, so that seemed a more natural fit with the Air Force than, say, the Army. For sure. And when you, when you signed up, was it only plans to fly or did you have, were you like, ah, just kind of no. do whatever? No, I never wanted to fly. Uh, so I started ROTC and uh, was told right away that I did not have the vision to be able to fly. I had uh, depth perception problems, astigmatism. Hmm. Uh, and so it was never really on my radar scope at all. 
uh, I want to be an astronaut, but that didn't, doesn't mean I want to fly. Yeah. I, I've been up in a plane, a general aviation, you know, Cessna a few times, a very few times. And I was like, oh, okay, that was fun, but whatever. It didn't grab me. Um, and I went through four years of college, was, uh, was planning on being a navigator. I got selected to be a navigator. Uh, but I didn't really know what that was. And honestly, I didn't plan on sticking with that. Um, I was going to maybe give that a try. And then right before graduating, they called me in. And they're like, hey, you know, there's a, a waiver for your eye issue. Uh, would you like us to pursue that and you can become a pilot? I was like, well, I didn't know there was a waiver. OK, sure, I guess. I guess so. This is like three months before graduating. Yeah. So like, I don't really want to be a navigator. Um, I don't know what else I want to do. I want to serve, you know, so sure, you can put me in for it. And then like two weeks later, the waiver came through. I got a pilot slot and uh, I was off to pilot training. And then the story of me becoming a pilot doesn't end there because I went through Navy pilot training, which was awesome. It was a really cool experience, but I didn't like it, man. I, I didn't think it was hard. I thought it was boring. I thought flying was um, was on the boring side. Like, really, it, it was fun. It was cool. Like, it was a neat thing to do. But to commit ten years of your life, flying from point A in my mind at the time, I was like mm -hmm. flying from point A to point B um, was not going to do it for me. I mean, ten years is a long for sure. time. And so I almost quit pilot training numerous times. And my wife convinced me that there was something more there. That it wasn't simply you know, getting airborne and flying from point A to point B. And, and uh, I did well in pilot training and, and got fighters. Uh, and then pretty much like right away, I fell in love with uh, being in a fighter squadron and, and, uh, and doing that job. So yeah, my whole mentality shifted at that point because it became about the mission and the people and the technology uh, more than about the flying. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I fell in love with. That's crazy. It's like I've met so many people that have from like high school on just fought to become a pilot. And it's like every step they're like trying to do the like exact perfect thing. And, and you're kind of shrugging off every step and it just kind of keeps falling in your lap like that. That's pretty awesome. That's a that's great. That's funny, too, that you said that they just happen to catch you by chance, the Air Force uh, ROTC guys, which I thought I mean, I grew up in a military family and uh, my dad was Army. I joined the Marines and I thought people knew more about the branches of military, but I've learned just from having conversations with people in real life and on, on the podcast that a lot of people didn't know anything. They're just like, Hey, I just went to the recruiter's office and this guy stuck his head out the door and he, he grabbed yeah. me like, and it was before anybody else could. I'm like, Oh, that's really, that really happens a lot more than I thought. I thought people went in like with a plan, like this is what I want to do. But yeah, yeah, that's pretty awesome. Is it normal for, Air Force pilots to attend naval uh, aviator training? Well, no longer. Uh, when I went through pilot training back in the early 2000s, about 5% of the Air Force pilots would go through Navy pilot training, and mm -hmm. the same 5% Navy pilots would go through Air Force pilot training. But we would only do the first half of pilot training with the other service. Okay. So I did t-34s at the time they're flying t-6s now down at pensacola and whiting field with the navy once again it was awesome glorious time and then after you track select fighters or heavies um then you go to the rest of the air force pilot training so i moved to vance air force base went through t-38 training at vance track selected fighters out of there and, uh, you know, was on my way with my Air Force career. And the Navy would do something similar. They'd go through T-6s advance or T-37s advance Air Force Base. And then they would track select and go to jets, T-45s down in Meridian, or they'd go off mm -hmm. to a Corpus Christi yeah. or, or Helos of Whiting. Yeah. Did you, I mean, at any time, did you, because you weren't that like set on even being a pilot, you know, it sounds like. Was there a platform you were shooting for? Were you wanting to be a fighter pilot if you were going to have to be a pilot? I, it was really up in the air, but I, I did have that idea that I, I wanted to be a fighter pilot more than a heavy pilot because I felt like the fighter pilot life was a little more stable. Uh, you know, you're, you're doing missions at home, you're training at home, you're sleeping in your bed at, at, at night. Uh, the... The heavy pilots seem to be on the road just all the time. Yeah. Uh, so that was a, a factor in it, as well as 
the, the idea of flying from point A to point B seemed more of like an airline pilot, heavy pilot type of thing. And I, yeah. I didn't like that that much. You know, I wanted to do something more with the technology. And so the fighter world seemed more uh, suited. So in, in the Air Force, obviously, there's multiple different platforms. The Marine Corps is more limited. You know, I mean, at that time, I'm sure it was just the F-18s and the uh, Harriers. What options for fighter pilot or fighter platforms did you have to move into uh, in training? Yeah, I, I will mention that I was very fortunate that I had choices. Like I did well enough in pilot training, but it was very, it's very competitive. I yeah. think it's good for your listeners to know like how incredibly competitive it is. Um, and uh, when you get into T-38s, there's a class of like six students um, around on average. And out of those six, um, one will stay as an instructor in T-38s for at least one assignment, and then they'll get a fighter or bomber after that. Um, one to two of the students will get bombers out of T-38s, and then three or four students will get assigned a fighter. The fighters you could get assigned, when I went through uh, A-10, F-15E, Strike Eagle, mm -hmm. F-15C, and the F-16. So those are the four fighters you could get now. Um, F-22 opened up not, not too long ago, and F-35s, I think, not too long ago uh, as well to be able to go to it right away. Now, F-22 and F-35 are single-seat sure. fighters that cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So yeah. it, it, I think it was a, for many years, let's get them trained up in an F-16 or F-15 and then, and then transition them into the F-22 or F-35. That's crazy to have those kinds of options and to like, I don't know. To me, I, I look at that because I've never been in a fighter jet, but it, I, it's like you describing it and talking about the different cars makes me feel like a, like a race car driver, like an F1 driver kind of describe it. You know, it's like something I've never done, but it sounds super cool. And like, I, it's just crazy hard to handle. Like you wouldn't just throw someone, like you said with the F-22, you wouldn't just throw someone in the F1 car. You know, you're going to start them off in like carts and then move them, move them up a little bit at a time to get used to the right. physics and all that stuff. So um, what platform did you land on and then where did you, where was your first duty station? And kind of, if you want to talk about, are there like units that you're really trying to strive to get to? There's a lot of historically like famous units in the Marine Corps. So sometimes guys come in wanting a specific unit. Did you have that same kind of desire? No. So one reason why I selected F-15Cs and I actually put down F-15Cs as my top choice out of pilot training. Mm -hmm. That was also more on a whim. Um, no one else in my class wanted F-15Cs. So I was just kind of playing um, the deck that I had for being like, well, I, you know, I could maybe get my first choice if I put this down. Um, so I put it down as my, my top choice, not really knowing many differences between those platforms. And mind you, this is after a year of pilot training, you still don't know much about, you know, these different platforms and, and how they're actually used. Mm -hmm. I mean, people tell you stories, but um, so I ended up uh, selecting F-15Cs, and then you go through advanced T-38 training, what we call IFF, Introductory to Fighter Fundamentals, and about 20% of the students wash out of that. So you're learning basic dogfighting skills in a T-38. And then I went to Tyndall Air Force Base to learn the F-15C, and it's all baby steps, right? You learn how to take off and land, you learn how to do instruments, and you learn dogfighting. Then you learn um, what we call air combat maneuvers or ACM, and then it goes up from there into larger engagements. Um, and about 20%, that, that's the number, 20% of the students washed out of that too. Um, and then I landed in um, uh, the 58th Fighter Squadron, the Gorillas, which is actually a, a very famous fighter squadron. Uh, Desert Storm 1 had all the MiG kills pretty much. Um, and I ended up there on a whim uh, because uh, my wife was in the military and that was the best base for us to be located at. So I think some people have that mentality. Mm -hmm. um, but as you can tell, I, I wasn't, I didn't understand or know the history. Um, even at that point, I just wanted to be able to fly and serve. And I was uh, uh, willing to go where they wanted me to go. And, and they wanted me to go to Eglin. They allowed me to go to Eglin to meet, you know, be with my wife. And uh, yeah, I loved it. It was an amazing first assignment. Sounds like you're just riding the wave, man. And you're having good luck along the way, you know? Yeah, Providence, uh, Fortune, yeah. For the people, you know, you're talking about 20 people get dropped here, 20 people get dropped there. Do those people still become pilots? Are they still pilots just on a different platform, or do they go out to do a different Air Force job? 
if you wash out of pilot training, um, you'll go get another Air Force job. If you wash out after you've finished pilot training, so the first year you get winged and you become a pilot in the Air Force, okay. and then you go on to specialized training. So if you wash out of T-38, advanced T-38s, or your fighter platform that you started on, you would go to another platform that was owned by that MATCHCOM that you were assigned to. So you'd usually go to AWACS, or you'd go to B-52s, or the B-1. Okay. Those would be the platforms you'd go to. Okay. Um, and when you're, when you're in school, do you know that these are like historical washout rates? Do you know that the washout yeah. rate's pretty high? Does that make the environment kind of weird? Like, do you... I don't know. Do you, I feel like you wouldn't be getting as close with people if you know that 20% of them are going to be leaving or getting kicked out of the, the course or whatever, or drop, not really kicked out, excuse me. Yeah. It didn't impact our relationships with each other. Yeah. It just taught us how to, uh, how to deal with that type of stress mm -hmm. or, you know, some people, you know, couldn't deal with that type of, uh, stress. It, it was frustrating, um, because I feel like the air force at times, didn't do the best job of um, of uh, teaching pilots how to deal with that stress and wash them out too quickly. Mm. Like for instance, in my F-15 class, great guy, good friend of mine. Um, back in the day, we uh, we started the week and he hadn't hooked any rides. We call it a hook if you bust a ride. Um, he hadn't hooked any rides at all. He had done the program just fine, and then a week later he was out. Um, and so. Things like that, I, I think the Air Force has actually leaned away from mm. because they realize that that's a little too aggressive, and you got to give people some room to make mistakes. Um, but it did teach you how to deal with that stress because every every flight, every maneuver you were doing, like you could find yourself busting a ride for just doing one maneuver wrong, mm -hmm. right? So it taught you how to deal with that that type of um, stress, the stressful environment. Were you, were you living in the unknown or were they giving you like a heads up? Like, Hey, you're, you know, you're really slacking on this. Like you need to keep an eye on it. Like, or is it one of those things where you just come in one day and they're like, Hey man, you're done. Sorry. Oh no. Yeah. Every flight you do. And this is something you get used to because this is how all pilot training is for years. You go through life like this. Every flight has about 40 to 50, somewhere around there, uh, graded events mm. and you get a one through five score on each of those events and there's a standard that you meet and as that, that standard increases so your first flight ones are what's expected so basically just like you're alive and you did it yeah. congratulations and then by the end you're getting threes and fours um, is what's expected and so yeah you get immediate feedback at the end of every flight every one of those uh, boxes is checked on how well you did so you know where that instructor thinks you fall. Um, and it, so you do have some awareness on how things are going. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, I was a, I'm not sure if you follow the podcast at all, um, but I was a JTAC while I was in and working in that community and working with the pilots and stuff. I've always really appreciated the thorough debriefs, you know, and it's one of those things where you got to have thick skin too, especially if you have like a senior uh, instructor debriefing you and, Sometimes they're a little harder than you'd like to hear, but it's like, hey, man, it's yeah. reality. You know, when it comes down to what we're doing here, there's not a lot of room for error, if at all. Um, so it's completely understandable. Um, what was the hardest part in the for the people you know that may be looking at and the Air Force as a career? You know, if they want to become a pilot, what was the hardest part for you in the initial pilot training? And what do you see a lot of people like? What's the, one of the main reasons a lot of people wash out? Yeah. The hardest part was knowing how to spend your time. So it's not easy as just saying time management, yeah. um, but it's understanding like when something needs more time than something else, because it's always competing priorities. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that's what flying is about, right? You're in a mission. Do you spend time looking at your radar right now? Or do you spend time looking outside? Or do you spend time looking at where your gas is and trying to plan how you're gonna meet up with the tanker, right? And the same was in pilot training, learning, uh, okay, I have an instrument test today, I have an aerobatic flight today, and then I have my uh, check ride for this other phase of flying tomorrow. Um, and then I have a simulator mission 
that's going to teach me about formation flying also today. And that was like every day was something like that, where you have three or four different, totally different topics. I mean, all related to pilot training, yeah. but, you know, different topics that you would need to know. How do you prepare and spend your time um, understanding what is important in this moment? And that is what I think people struggle with. They try to get everything right. Mm -hmm. they, they try to get a 99% solution on each one of those events, and they're not going to. Right? They, they've got to be willing to accept um, an 80% solution here, a 50% solution there, and a 95% solution on this one important thing that I've got to get right. Mm -hmm. and, and understanding that is probably just a life lesson uh, because uh, too often, you know, we find ourselves focused, as I do all the time, on the wrong thing. And that may be spending time with your family um, compared to certain work projects, or that may be, you know, flying in a, a 4v8 air-to-air -air mission. Uh, you know, it's all similar lessons. I've told people, you know, about being a JTAC. They're like, man, that's a sweet job. That'd be really cool. And I'm like, it is. I was like, but the key to it is being able to take in a lot of information and and do something with that you know like put out a quality product meaning you know a a, uh, a nine line and a, you know a fire mission whatever and it'd be safe and everything work like understand the geometries i'm like you have to be able to take in a ton of information and have very limited time to come up with a solution that is the safest way or, or most efficient way you know to complete the problem you know yes so i see kind of that's probably similar would you yeah. agree Oh, yeah. Yes, I was an air liaison officer for a few years. Um, so, yeah, it's it's very similar to the JTAC world and, and having to do that. So how, how long were you in the cockpit flying around before you, you moved to the ground side for a little bit? Because in the Marine Corps, you know, pilots do their due time as a pilot, and then they have to do a two-year ground tour. And a lot of them go and become forward air controllers or something like that with either an Anglico or an artillery unit. Um, I know the Air Force is a little different, so you want to kind of go through that, how that works? Yeah, the, the Air Force back in the early 2000s was actually similar. Mm -hmm. um, you would do one fighter assignment uh, where you would hopefully leave as a flight lead, mm -hmm. uh, four-ship flight lead, I think was kind of the standard, or two-ship, four-ship flight lead. Uh, and then you would go do what we called back then an alpha tour. And an alpha tour was about a two or three year assignment out of the fighter cockpit. And then you go back after that alpha tour to a fighter squadron again. Those alpha tours were a UAV pilot, an instructor pilot at pilot training, or an air liaison officer. So one of those three. Now a few people stayed in the cockpit. Those were like the cream of the crop, uh, pilots, tacticians that they wanted that the like leadership wanted to become weapons officers or, or be competitive to become a weapons officer. And that's the weapons school is a, a six month course at Nellis Air Force Base mm -hmm. where you're creating the instructors of the instructors, yeah. right? the tactical experts. Um, and so you get a few people got to stay in the cockpit and they would just move to a different uh, fighter squadron uh, around the world and they would continue uh, their journey. For me, I served for um, two and a half years in my first fighter squadron, and I actually requested um, to stay in a flying aircraft. I didn't want to be a weapons officer. It, it's a lifestyle choice too. Like that's uh, some pretty intense hours that th those folks are working. Um, and so I requested to stay in a cockpit so that I could uh, try to become a test pilot. Hmm. And so they gave me the one job um, that took me out of the cockpit, which was air liaison <laughs> officer. And, of course. You know, <laughs> there, there I was uh, in Germany, loving the location, amazing location, and uh, getting this really cool experience. But it was, um, it, it, to me, it was very disappointing. It was a, uh, a hard pill to swallow because mm -hmm. I had done very well, mind you, in my first fighter squadron. Um, I, uh, I was accomplished there. Um, and to get this one job that I didn't want because it, it took test pod school away from me. Uh, so that was, that was tough, but, um, you know, there's a lot of times where you don't get what you want and you, you think that you deserve something else, mm -hmm. um, or you think that something's going to be better for you. Uh, and you have to be able to see beyond that. 
Uh, and so I worked hard where I was at, and you know, I'm sure we can talk more about it, but it unfolded differently than I that I had originally thought when I got assigned the air liaison officer job. Yeah, for sure. Uh, before we talk about your time with the ALO, do you want to? Can you tell us what a weapons officer is in the Air Force and what kind of the role is? Because you say it's a it's a lifestyle choice. Is this the backseater in an aircraft, or, or are you talking about uh, on a, like a different platform or something else? Yeah, so what we call a weapons systems officer yeah. or WISO or a combat system officer now that they're called a CISO, um, they are backseaters in Strike Eagles okay. or WISOs can also be in like B1, they have a WISO um, and there's other WISOs, a B-52 has some WISOs. Uh, when I say weapons officer, I'm not referring to the, okay. that. Yeah, a weapons officer are instructors in a weapons platform, so like the F-15C, um, and they are um, the tactical expert in each squadron. So each squadron has a weapons officer, and that weapons officer has gone through weapons school, and they're the ones that develop the tactics, and that they are the ta tactical experts, and they're the ones that actually Gotcha. Uh, run the training plan at the home squadron and they instruct the instructors. Yeah. So you're like the WTI in the Marine Corps, like the top gun. It, graduates. Oh, same thing. Yeah. yeah. That's actually the same thing. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That's a, I've known guys that have gone to WTI and, um, I know sometimes they have other forces. Does the air force ever send anybody over to WTI? I know the Navy does occasionally. I don't know anyone that went through WTI. Okay. Yeah. It's, um, guys that have gone through it are like, Hey, it's the best training. You know, you're going to come out being the best you've ever been, but they're like, it's the worst six months ever. Cause you're just getting kicked in the face, you know, multiple times a day by these other instructors that are all, you know, the best in the world at, at their jobs and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's funny. You want to sign up for something like that. Uh, so for your ALL, a, uh, ALO world, you know, the air liaison officer world, you want to explain kind of your role in that, how that works, uh, how the uh, TACP works on the Air Force side? Because a lot of my listeners are fire support men from the Marine Corps and JTACs and stuff like that. So we, we understand, you know, the fire side from our side. If you want to kind of break it down a little bit for the Air Force side and also give us your impressions of, you know, now being a ground guy, going from, you know, living in a cockpit and doing that and being solely responsible, you know, for your aircraft and yourself and stuff to being now being on the ground. Yeah, it, it was cool to get a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, it was frustrating because, and the Air Force has remedied this, it was frustrating because the Air Force just put millions of dollars into my training. Yeah, yeah. Right? And then they put me into a ground job that does not, I'd say most of the time, does not require my expertise of air. Like you can teach, and we're successfully proving this now by having professional air liaison officers, like that is their job and only job. Mm -hmm. um, you can teach them air sense, how to interact with pilots and air crew without them having uh, have that, without them having, you know, air crew experience. So I was frustrated um, because I felt like it was not, um, it, it just wasn't what it wasn't what I was trained for. Yeah. <clears throat> now I was fortunate. I feel too because I got sent to an ASOC squadron. I was assigned to the Fourth Air Support Operations Squadron, the Fourth ASOS in Mannheim, uh, Army installation, uh, with the Fifth SIG um, out uh, in Germany, and our ASOS was one of three ASOC squadrons, so Air Support Operations Center, where our job was to ensure that the other JTACs, the other TACPs and the air crew were connected, right? So if people don't know, you know, a TACP or tactical air control party um, with JTACs in it and ALOs, um, you know, they would be the ones calling in the weapon strikes mm -hmm. as your listeners, most of them know. Um, but to get that right aircraft with the right munitions to the right JTAC required an ASOC. And so I was in a squadron that managed that uh, conduit of communication. So we we helped run that center that would connect those two. Gotcha. Yeah, that's tough, man. That would be tough to. You're right. You know, you don't need you don't need pilots to sit there and do that. We we have DASC Marines that do stuff like that. That's what we call the. You know, I'm sure. Yeah, you're familiar with the DASC. So, yeah, that's tough. I I would be upset about that as well. You know, and I understand completely. We have the same kind of. 
we'd have JTAX go through training and spend a ton of money, you know, getting these guys to become fully certified and designated JTAX. And then the Marine Corps would come down and be like, oh, hey, sorry, we need a recruiter over here. Oh. So we're pulling you out of this for three years. And you oh, lose yeah. all your certifications. You lose experience if you've had any. I knew a guy who got pulled to go to recruiting right after finishing TECP school. Like he didn't even get any time. It's so it's like you just wasted a seat and wasted money in a in an MOS that's like highly critical. I'm sure you're aware. And um, yeah. yeah, it's just crazy. At what point were you after you were finishing up your ground tour at the ASOS? What 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 was next for you? Like what did you have planned, and then what kind of actually came to be? Well, I'll say it kind of happened in the middle of my tour. Everything changed for me. Um, I really wanted to be a test pilot. Mm -hmm. I wanted to marry up my flying with engineering background. Uh, so I, it's a very long story that I won't bore people with, but it was crazy the way that it worked out. Um, I had basically applied for test pilot school um, and they, they said, no, you don't have the hours yet. And I was never going to have the hours because this ALO tour was going to be a three year. They just extended all ALOs to a month after I got there to three year tours instead of two year tours. So I was never going to be able to get back to a cockpit in time to apply for test spot school because there's a time limit on, on um, how old you can be. So I, I was never going to apply. And this was the one shot I had. So I applied and I was only out of the cockpit for about four months when I applied and they said no. Um, and I said, well, what if I were to get a fighter squadron to, um, agree to put me through an IPUG and take me back on board if you select me to give me the hours that I need. And then the board people, which have blew kind of my mind that they agreed to this, they were like, yeah, if you can get a, a fighter squadron to do that. So I found a guard unit flying F-15Cs that agreed to, if I got selected to become a test pilot, they would bring me back. And my commander agreed to it, my ALO commander, and said, yeah, if, if you get picked up, so I didn't get picked up, but I was the next guy on the list. Mm. That's how close I was. So my my group commander um, got a call from the TPS commandant, the person in charge of TPS. Uh, and the commandant told my group commander, like, listen, he was the next guy to get picked up. He needs to fly. Um, and if he doesn't fly uh, and get more hours, he's done. Like, he, he won't be able to apply. So my group commander... 24 hours later, pulled me into his office with my squadron commander, and I'm, I'm set to deploy as an ALO six weeks later. Mm -hmm. um, said, listen, uh, Cinco, do you want to fly the MC-12? And I looked at him, and I was like, I don't know what an MC-12 is. Like, <laughs> what is this? He's like, well, it's a platform that has never flown yet, um, but they're looking for the initial cadre for it, and you're so close to becoming getting selected to become a test pilot. I want to make this dream a reality for you. Um, would you like to go fly and be eligible for test pilot school? My squadron commander at the time was like, uh, boss, uh, he's deploying in six weeks and I need him to leave, you know, with me. Yeah. And my, the, his senior, my group commander, uh, was like, actually there's sometimes things more important than what the, the squadron needs. And I feel like we need to take care of Cinco. Um, and so I said, yeah, I'll fly. And it just so happened that there was like another 24 hour window that, uh, was open for, they were looking for the initial cadre. So this all happened within like 48 hours. Uh, and I said, yes. And then I got pulled from my deployment. I got assigned to be initial cadre of MC 12, uh, which was still nine months away. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, but because of that, I then, uh, went and flew the MC 12, which gave me the hours to be able to apply for test pod school. Um, and then the MC-12 experience was uh, just mind-blowing, uh, remarkable, impactful um, thing, most you know, impactful thing I've done in the military. Wow, um, really? Yeah, minus my most recent uh, command opportunity with the F-35, which was you know much later. But yeah, it was awesome uh, being the initial cadre on that platform. So. That's why I say it happened in the middle of my ALO tour, because I went and did the MC-12, initial cadre for it, flew in Afghanistan, was a chief instructor pilot for um, that platform. As we stood up from zero aircraft in Afghanistan to 12, you know, flying a few missions a day and having 10 air crew to having 200 plus air crew by the end of my tour there. Wow. Um, and then I went back to being an ALO for uh, six months, because, or pardon me, a year, I had to then apply for test pod school and then i had to go interview for test pod school and get picked up for test pod school so that's what kind of um unfolded 
uh, before I ever became a test pilot. That's pretty awesome that your command, you know, stood up for you like that or like kind of helped you out like that. You know, a lot of times you'll hear plenty of people complain about their command, not ever helping them out. So that's, that's good that you, you know, hear a positive story from that. Um, for the MC-12, that's a, uh, for those that don't know, that's an ISR platform, the uh, Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance Platform. Um, can you talk, you want to talk about what that platform actually is as, as much as you can? I'm not really sure what you can talk about with it. Yeah. No, no. I mean, it's, it's basically uh, tactical ISR. So we were the eyes and the ears of the ground troops. Uh, we had a full motion video. We had mm-hmm. very good uh, ball. I mean, it was probably the best sensor, sorry, ball and sensor um, that was being flown in Afghanistan at the time. Um, and so we could see a whole lot of what was going on and we would be, you know, uh, over the operators, if that's them in a convoy, um, being able to recognize IEDs um, or threats, or if that was over a compound, uh, you know, watching them as they did their business. Um, or if that was just doing traditional ISR work where we were looking for certain individuals or certain like vehicle borne IEDs, mm-hmm. um, things like that, we would be the eyes and the ears uh, kind of of the battle space. Now, why we were different than predators or reapers, um, we we're non kinetic, so we, we had no capability to impact the battlefield um, you know, with weapons, uh, but it was very low latency. So, what took um, a predator operator seven seconds to respond to a, a, a ground troops request mm-hmm. would take us half a second. And that right there was life and death. And so we were the ones uh, that brought it tactical ISR into the battlefield. That's awesome. Yeah. So, and again, for the people that don't know the predators and stuff aren't flown like right there in Afghanistan, they're flown elsewhere. So through the satellite, you know, you get that delay and everything. So that's what, what you're talking about there. I actually, I think I only worked with one MC 12. We were in a pretty, pretty good sustained firefight and one showed up and was kind of, I think we used them to manage the airspace while we were kind of dealing with what was going on on the ground, which was, you know, obviously helpful, you know, anything like that helps out. Um, so back to ALO, when you went back, were your guys, oh, I guess you deployed too. So were, was there anyone there that was like, oh, welcome back. You decided to join us again, you know, like coming back to that. <laughs> yeah. It, it, honestly, no, the community was, I found very um, welcoming uh, yeah. and it was a great group of individuals. It was really an honor to serve with the folks in the fourth ASOS. And so everyone had my back, uh, you know, the all leadership and then everyone else in the squadron. So it was it was great getting back into it. And we stood up the gateway, which is um, a data link platform used by air liaison officers or by TACP really um, that allowed them to see uh, on your guys's tablet where other platforms were mm-hmm. airborne. So it was a data link for ground troops. And so we stood that capability up, which was really cool too. And it was fun to be a part of that. And, um, yeah. No, I didn't get any negativity from it. I've been out for a few years now, but I remember, you know, I was there when the tablets first kind of came around in the Marine Corps and WTI was kind of working on them and stuff. And I took one to Afghanistan with me, one of the first iterations of it. And what an amazing tool, you know, like having the ability for us and the pilots too to just both be on the same page about what we're looking at so quickly. Um, I don't know. I, I can't imagine what they're doing with them now. I know they, you know, data link was something that we were working on and stuff. I'm sure that's a lot more, you know, we don't have to get into it, but I'm yeah. sure it's a lot more uh, capable now, but what a great tool to have. I'm sure. Well, we'll skip over that. I, I know we're limited on time. So I, I, I'll let's focus the rest of the time on your, on the test pilot and, you know, yeah. on from there. Can you kind of talk about why one why you want to be a test pilot a lot of people are gonna hear that and be like what because you just think in your mind like going out and flying wonky aircraft that may or may not make it back you know um what made you want to be a test pilot and then what are some of if there's people out there that want to also be a test pilot what should they is there any way to prepare for that or what should they expect if that's like a, a dream of them for them yeah no being a test pilot was always something that was on my radar um I met a few of them when I was in my first fighter squadron. Mm -hmm. And then I started learning about like, well, how do these systems that I'm using right now as a wingman, how do they uh, get fielded? You know, what's that whole acquisition cycle look like? Uh, And then you quickly find out that, you know, a developmental test pilot are the ones 
uh, that are the first to make sure that a system is safe to use and the system meets contractual specifications. Uh, so if in the contract, you know, an F-35 is supposed to fly at 50,000 feet, well, someone needs to go take the aircraft up and ensure that it flies at 50,000 feet. So you make sure it's safe and then you make sure it meets the contract. If it doesn't meet the contract, then you work with the engineers, um, the program office, uh, the contractor, so an F-35 case of Lockheed Martin, uh, and you try to get the platform or the system up to con contractual specifications. And then once it meets the contract and it's safe to fly, you kick it over the, the wall to operational test pilots. Operational test pilots now ring out that system in emulated combat environments, scenarios, and make sure that it is exactly uh, useful on the battlefield the way that they had hoped it was going to be useful. Because sometimes contractual specifications don't directly, you know, uh, equate to combat effectiveness, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So you have uh, these operators um, that are operational test bots making sure it's good. And then after them, it gets to the actual pilot um, that, that is in the fighter squadron and they're able to use it. So developmental test pilots are the ones that go through what we call test pilot school and they learn to be the first ones uh, to fly something. Um, and so I love the idea of kind of marrying my, um, my love of engineering and my love of aviation. And mind you, it's a love of aviation that is really like tactical aviation. Mm -hmm. um, and bringing those together uh, was an awesome path. And I, once I learned more about it, it was, it, it was my professional goal was to become those people that could get the right capability into the hands of the warfighter and make sure that it was what they needed. What were they looking for in test pilot school and how many people make it through that that apply? Um, yeah, the, the test pilot, can you say that one more time? I'm what, sorry. like, what were the instructors looking for at test pilot school? Yeah. Like what, you know, what attributes did you have that they want that they want? And then also what were reasons that guys may not have made it through? Yeah. Um, so to be able to apply for test pilot school, you need to have, um, um, engineering background, which just means a degree in engineering or physics or math. Um, and so a STEM, basically a STEM degree. Uh, and then you're looking for people that understand the systems, understand how they're used, and that can work well with the team to, um, to relay those requirements that the operator has to the engineers and the acquisition professionals who are trying to get them what they want. Um, so you need someone that's very even keel as well, because you are in scenarios where things aren't going to go the way that you expected because no one's been there before, right? If I'm taking the F-35 for the first time at 50,000 feet, no one's been there. They don't know how that platform is going to perform at 50,000 feet. Mm -hmm. And so you need uh, someone that can kind of roll with the punches um, and make, uh, you know, informed, uh, decisive um, decisions uh, in the heat of the moment. For sure. Right? Yeah. So basically yeah. what we were talking about before. So same there. Did, do most people that, I mean, it, just to get to that point, you have to be like an above average individual, I'm sure. So do many people not make it through test pilot school or is that pretty high graduation rate at that point? Yeah. It's, I've never heard of a pilot that didn't make it through test pilot school okay. in the past few decades. So I think there's some flight test engineers that it's a shock for them. Um, because they're not used to that environment. Mm -hmm. It's like a pilot training environment. You get a master's degree while you, it's just very intense, but pi all the pilots are used to it. It's yeah. like pilot training, right? Um, so it is very competitive to get into test pilot school. That's where the, the differentiator is. So once you get in, you're in, and it's an amazing community. Um, but to be able to get in, you need to have uh, that STEM background. You need to have done very well with your degrees. You probably need a master's degree as well. I had a master's degree in aerospace engineering as well on top of my undergrad. You're looking at undergrad GPAs over 3.5 uh, is average. Master's degree GPAs over 3.8 probably. Um, you're looking at uh, about a 80 to 100 fighter pilots that will apply every year and they'll take 10 of them and you have about a three year window where you can apply. So it's extremely competitive. Um, and, you know, I put it in terms that 
people may understand, like, I think for about six years running, or like, it was some crazy number, man. I, so don't quote me on it. But I think like the top graduate out of uh, the Air Force Academy became a test pilot. Mm. Um, so the caliber is really high. I, and mind you, I felt like out of place. Like I wasn't yeah. that, I wasn't get that caliber, but it really is um, the, the cream of the crop that end up applying. Uh, so then once you get accepted and you have to go interview and it's a flying interview, so they put you in aircraft that you're unfamiliar with and, and evaluate you mm. with like no time. They, they don't give you any instruction. They give you a book to read um, you know, the night before, and then you, you go to the interview, you get thrown in the cockpit and you have to go do these maneuvers in a plane that you're unfamiliar with. Um, yeah, if you make it through all that and get picked up, you're going to make it through and be just fine as a test pilot. That's pretty awesome. So you, um, looking at your, uh, the information you sent me, you, you worked at the 40th flight test squadron and the 461st flight test squadron. What are, is there a difference in the two and yeah. what were you doing at those, uh, different squadrons? Yeah, so as a test pilot, you could end up flying things that are very different than what you grew up flying. I grew up flying the F-15C, um, but typically what happens is you go test the aircraft, the airframe you came from. So I went to the 40th Flight Test Squadron, which is at Eglin Air Force Base, and the two main bases that we do test flying is Eglin Air Force Base in the Panhandle, Florida, and Edwards Air Force Base out of the Mojave Desert in California. Mm -hmm. So I went to the 40th and tested F-15Cs and F-15Es, primarily radar work. So we were testing new radars and we were testing new weapons. Mm -hmm. So a lot of weapons work. Um, and as test spots there, you need to be um, like mission qualified. We would have to go to red flag. We'd have to do all those things that we had to do as fighter pilots. So, you know, BFM, um, dogfighting, uh, you know, all of those qualifications we had to hold on to. Um, and then we just would take those those systems out to the corners of the envelope and make sure that they worked um, and that they were effective also in our training missions. Um, and then I went and managed the F-35 program and I'll kind of skip through that. It was acquisition work for a few years. It was, mm -hmm. was eye-opening. Um, and because of that F-35 work, I went out to Edwards and was a director of operations of the 461st Flight Test Squadron. The 461st was responsible for F-35 developmental test. Um, so I was the director of operations uh, for one year, and then I fleeted up, we call it, to command. Uh, and I was the commander there for two years, um, delivering F-35 capability to the warfighter. That's an interesting place. I was out at um, NTC doing some work with F-35s um, out of Edwards. And... Um, I hit him up. I was like, Hey man, here's my cell phone number. You know, I told him on the radio. I was like, here's my cell phone number. I'd love to come out and get a, a brief if that's possible. And they were very, you know, forthcoming with that. They're like, yeah, let's set something up. And I was out at NTC a different time. And on my way back, I just drove through there. <clears throat> I set something up with them and drove through there and had like a face to face with one of the pilots. This was in like 2000, probably 15. And, nice. uh, yeah, it was cool. They they walked me around the aircraft. They showed me the really sick helmet, like all that stuff. And we kind of, it's different when you get to sit there and have a face to face with the pilot and kind of discuss some of the capabilities or some of the questions you have on the ground that there's just not enough time to, you know, go back and forth over the radio and stuff like that. Um, so that was really cool. It, it, plus Edwards is just so far out there in the middle of nowhere. I imagine yeah. there's some pretty awesome stuff going on out there with like NASA and, and you guys just... Yeah. What a what a what a sweet gig! Um, on your Instagram page, you put down that the F thirty five on one of your posts. You put down that like the F thirty five is like the quarterback of the sky. Can you kind of explain that to people, like what you, what you mean yeah. by that, and um, how do you see the F thirty five role in the future? There's a lot of people that hate on the F thirty five right now. You know, cost yeah. overruns and stuff like that. So if you want to kind of give us a pitch of why the F thirty five is awesome, I'd love to hear it. Yeah, no, I mean, there's so much to unpack there. Um, I'll talk about a few things that hit on a few points real quick. So one, um, the 461st Flight Test Squadron, we were responsible for flight science testing of the F-35A, which means the interaction of the airframe with the atmosphere, like can it pull 9Gs, can it fly at 1.6 Mach, um, can it carry these weapons while it's doing those things. Mm -hmm. um, but we are also responsible, that was just for the A variant, so that's the conventional takeoff and land variant. Um, we are also responsible for mission systems testing of all three variants. So that's why there's only probably a dozen of us out there that we've uh, flew all three 
F-35 variants. So the B variant hovers Marine mm -hmm. Corps, and the C variant is the Navy and Marine Corps, where it you know, catapults and uh, traps on an uh, aircraft carrier, uh, to make sure that the mission systems of all three were very similar and worked the same and uh, interacted with uh, each other the way they were supposed to. Um, so the platform itself I got there, uh, I didn't, I, I wasn't a full believer for sure. I, I thought the same, I had the same frustration, and I still have the same frustrations that it cost so much and took so much time. Um, but I, I realized uh, pretty quickly how capable this thing was because it's it's the first dual role stealth fighter. So it did air to air and air to ground and it was stealth, you know, the Raptor came before it, but it was just air to air. Mm -hmm. It does a little air to ground now, but um, regardless, the F-35 could do a lot of mission sets. It wasn't going to replace the A-10 like the A-10 was on the battlefield, but it was going to be able to do some casts. It was going to be able to do seed suppression of enemy air defenses. It was going to be able to do air to air and other air to ground, um, you know, tasks and maritime interdiction and the list goes on with the, the capability. So why I became a believer though, is the information at the fingertips of the operator is like no other platform in the history of aviation. Like I know more information than the AWACS. Now the AWACS sees farther out than I would in the F-35. But when I'm in close, like the AWACS is not as helpful mm -hmm. because I just, I, I have um, really advanced capability with my sensors that is giving me situational awareness of the entire battlefield. So what was before me flying my fighter aircraft where I'm looking inside and looking at my radar and then looking outside and finding my formation, you don't do that anymore in the F-35 or not nearly as much because I have all the information about my formation right on the screen in front of me and it's very accurate information. You know, we have the Jehemix and other fighters, joint helmet mounting queuing systems. So a cool helmet and other fourth gen fighters that would tell us a lot of information, but mm -hmm. it wasn't as accurate as the, the platform uh, that the F-35 helmet, you know, the F-35 helmet has. So it, it changed um, the ability of the operator to really manage everything that was going on. Because the one thing the Raptor did was absorb a lot of information on the battlefield, but it could not disseminate that to other players. The F-35 absorbed it and disseminated it. So it became the quarterback of the battlefield, being able to tell people like where all their threats were and how they needed to target. And it could do electronic attacks. So it could like jam the enemy while it's finding the enemy, while it's bombing the enemy. Um, so it is pretty remarkable in that sense. And it was very agile. So I, we saw it all the time. The system wouldn't work. Some capability, um, you know, wasn't there. And in, in um, historical platforms, like fourth gen platforms, six months or a year later, you'd be able to fix that capability. It would take some big software drop um, but the F-35, because it was so mission system software dependent, do two weeks later, I could have a, a fix to the software and be able to uh, go prosecute the attack. Uh, and, and that agility, uh, I think we can do even better on. Like that's something that we have got to even get faster. Mm -hmm. um, but that ability is unlike any platform uh, before it, period, I, dot. I was going to say like, you know, the way you're talking about the system and the, the plane itself, are we even flying it to its full capability? Do you think, are we able to fly it to its full capability? Um, well, once again, that agility is going to play in because what was before a difficult, um, like it's difficult to adapt to uh, a new sensor. Yeah. Right, like in the F-15C, if we had a new sensor, like say you want to put a targeting pod on the F-15C, well, man, that is going to take a very long time because you need to make sure that all the systems are working together and you can't just plug and play. The F-35, I think, is going to create an ability for us to, to do a little bit more plug and play. Like I said, they could change the software quickly. Mm -hmm. That is also true. You can you can upgrade hardware and do things that I think are is going to make the platform more agile. Um, so it's it's not quite there yet. Like the F thirty five isn't easily switching out sensors, for instance. But I think that the the groundwork is there. The foundation is set to be able to allow the platform to do that. Um, so in that sense, it's it is good. 
um, and uh, and I, I think continue to be very effective on the battlefield. Um, but it's tough to say because you never know what like threats are going to come, right? Quantum yeah. computing could be fixed by or figured out by China, you know, in a month from now, and then everything's, you know, out the door. Or maybe people will figure out how to uh, find F-35s, um, you know, and their stealth capabilities no longer needed, right? So then how do you, how do you address some of those big uh, innovative uh, transitions or pivots that, that maybe a, a, um, an adversary could make? And, and that's, that's hard to answer. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you got to stay, that's one of those things, you got to try to stay ahead of the curve on, on technology and stuff like that. What's your take on the, I think it was the Air Force, it might have been, been the Navy, I can't remember, who just had a UAV refuel an aircraft in air? Yeah, yeah, the Navy did that. Um, well, I've seen some amazing work by the X-47 program um, years ago where they would autonomously refuel mm -hmm. from a tanker. Um, so the ability of the UAV being the tanker aircraft in that sense, it, it to me, it, like, I was more like, yep, it's about time. <laughs> like, I think that there's a lot of, um, a lot of our aviation technology can be automated, right? Mm -hmm. Why should I have to be so exact with my air refueling skills? Like air refueling can be very difficult. Yeah. Um, and I've done both the Air Force you know, boom refueling or the probe drogue, the Navy Marine Corps style. And it can be challenging, right? Why do that if I can have a system do that for me? Um, like fly me to the, the boom, uh, keep me in position there. And I don't think you'll get rid of a pilot from a cockpit anytime soon, but I think you're going to find uh, systems are able to do a lot of um, the pilot's current job. Mm -hmm. Like why, and the F-35 is kind of, uh, helped us along this path with, and the, the Hornet's similar too, where you have auto, very good autopilot and very good auto throttles. Dude, I'm no longer having to select or fly a certain airspeed with my throttle, like jockeying my throttle up and down. I just press a button and say fly 300 knots and I, I stop worrying about my airspeed control. You know, when I'm, uh, you know, flying around and have a very good autopilot, I'm no longer so focused on like flying the aircraft. And that's a good thing. Right. As we advance our autonomous capability, we adopt artificial intelligence into the cockpit, which isn't really there yet, but it'll get there soon enough. And I'm, sh I'm sure of it. For sure. Um, you know, we're going to find the operator having to interact with the um, technology differently. It doesn't mean the operator is not needed. It's just that they can focus on other things. Dude, it's just the same as aviation has advanced over the decades. Yeah. Right. What well, what used to be a pilot having to, like, worry about the mixture of the fuel, like, Dude, that, that went, went away years ago, right? Decades ago. And that's a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. The pilot can be focused on other aspects of it, and especially for a combat aviator. Yeah, I love that idea. I think that all, you know, automate all the capability uh, that you can uh, so that you can focus the operators on what's, uh, what is requiring their input, right? The complex interactions. Um, the moral decision making, like that's what you want an air, uh, an operator for. Yeah, for sure. Do you? So you don't think in any time soon that we'll uh, lose pilots to uh, you know just autonomous vehicles? Do you see it more realistic to have like a pilot in that quarterback position that's in charge of multiple autonomous vehicles, like running it from their platform? Yeah, I think that that is um, a definite future. I, I think there are some platforms that may go autonomous, like a tanker aircraft may yeah. go autonomous. I'm not sure, but um, I think that a fighter aircraft, because they're making life and death decisions and you need something that's low latency, you can't afford to you know have the satellite signal take seven seconds to get back to you. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the operators are going to be doing more um, of the battlefield management. And I think that they are going to be managing uh, some of those UAVs. Um, I, I'm not for certain, I don't know what that future holds. I'm not really in that aspect of the Air Force right now. Um, so I do think that that is what we need because that allows you to have the low latency decision-making still with an operator, a human, um, but they're on the battlefield and they can manage more effectively You know those those type of scenarios with, uh, you know, UAVs.
definitely. Um, yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting thing to watch over the next like twenty years. You know, as this technology really kind of comes into comes into its own, and like you said, the AI stuff gets implemented and and increases. You know, we're only it's only getting better and better. We talked a little bit at the beginning. You know, AI is kind of touching a little bit of everybody's lives right now, even if they don't realize it. Um, yeah. I, like I said, I, I know you're short on time, so uh, we can go ahead and wrap it up here unless there's any uh, last things you want to want to go over. Well, you know, it's been fascinating learning about this artificial intelligence world and really how ubiquitous it is in our lives, our daily lives. Mm -hmm. And it, it's going to be in aviation, uh, you know, not just, of course, in the administrative portion of like scheduling our commercial airliners and, um, you know, air crew training and, and some other administrative tasks, but no kidding in like sensor integration um, in maximization, optimization of uh, certain combat capability. Um, and it, it's important for us to know how to um, respond ethically, transparently uh, to the development of this technology. Mm -hmm. So that's the one thing that, um, I, you know, I'd leave your listeners with is the, the technology is something that we can't shun, just like the F-35, like there's good, amazing things about it. There's things that aren't great, but that doesn't mean that we don't need the platform, right? It doesn't mean we don't need AI. Um, we just need to, to make sure that we're doing it, uh, developing it in a, a manner that uh, aligns with our values. And we've got to get after it right away yeah. because our adversaries are getting after it faster than we are and they are not concerned with the same values that we're concerned about. So they're able to do it in a fashion that um, is, uh, is more of a challenge uh, for us. So yeah, I think it's important for us to understand that um, that future is here and we've got to get after it as a society and we have to have the tough conversations now and do it the right way. And that includes, you know, how we approach the battlefield and how we use that type of technology yeah. um, in aircraft and on the ground. Yeah, there's a lot of ethics questions out there that that are going to have to be answered. You know, you're you're completely right about that. All right, uh, Colonel ha Colonel Hamilton, thanks for uh, you know I know you're busy, so I appreciate the time. I'm sure people you know really enjoyed this conversation talking about a 35 AI and all that. Um, they can find your Instagram is at Cinco Hamilton, which is awesome. You know, I've been following it for a little while, and I really enjoy as as a JTAC. I really enjoy like the uh, ordnance videos and stuff like that, and how you put everything together. I think it's really cool stuff. Um, some people don't like, you know, seeing ordinance videos. I don't know why they say they think it's crazy or whatever, but I personally like it. I think it's good stuff. I really appreciate you putting that stuff out there. And I think it's, that's the kind of PR stuff that the military needs, you know, people out there showing the interesting sides of their fields and stuff like that and kind of how things are implemented yeah. and, and employed. So that's really awesome. Um, for everyone else, make sure to check out my Instagram. It's at Jake Kramer graphics and at former action guys, both of those. And, uh, my website's jkramergraphics.com and that's, that's it. Thanks, everybody. All right, man. Um,